what are black holes? What do we humans understand about black holes? And what's still unknown? Einstein's theory, extended by people like Roger Penrose, tells us that um, black holes are, in a sense, rather simple things, basically, because uh, they are um, um, solutions of Einstein's equations. Um, and the thing that was shown in the 1960s by Roger Penrose in particular, um, and by a few other people, was that um, a black hole, when it forms and settles down, is defined just by two quantities, its mass and its spin. So they're actually very standardized objects. It's amazing that objects as standardized as that um, can be so big and can lurk in the rest of the solar system. Uh, and so that's the situation for a ready formed black hole. But the way they form, obviously, is very messy and complicated. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things that I've worked on a lot is um, what the phenomena are which are best attributed to black holes and what may lead to them and all that. And um, uh, Which, uh, can you explain to that? So what, what, what are the different phenomena that lead to a black hole? Okay, well, let's, let's talk yes. about it. This is oh, so okay, cool. Well, uh, this is so cool. So, yeah. Yes, okay. okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think one thing that only became understood really in the 1950s, I suppose, and beyond was um, uh, how stars evolve differently depending on how heavy they are. Yeah. The, the sun... Um, burns hydrogen to helium, and then when it's run out of that, it contracts to be a white dwarf. And uh, we know how long that will take. It'll take about 10 billion years altogether for its lifetime. Um, but big stars burn up their fuel more quickly and more interestingly, because when they've turned hydrogen to helium, they then get even hotter, so they can fuse helium into carbon and go up the periodic table. And then they eventually explode when they have an energy crisis and they blow out that process material, which as a digression is crucially important because um, all the atoms inside our bodies were synthesized inside a star, a star that lived and died more than 5 billion years ago before our solar system formed. Mm -hmm. And so we each have inside us atoms made in thousands of different stars all over the Milky Way. And that's an amazing idea. And my predecessor, Fred Hoyle, in 1946 was the first person to suggest that idea. And that's been borne out, that's a wonderful idea. Um, so um, that's how massive stars explode. And they leave behind something which is very exotic and of two kinds. One possibility is a neutron star, and these were first discovered in 1967, 68. Um, these are stars a bit heavier than the sun, uh, which are compressed to an amazing density. So the whole mass of more than the sun's mass is in something about 10 miles across. So um, they're extraordinarily dense, very exotic physics. Um, and and they, they've, been, they've been studied in immense detail. And they've been real laboratories because the good thing about astronomy, apart from exploring what's out there, is to use the fact that the cosmos has provided us with a lab mm -hmm. with far more extreme conditions than we could ever simulate. And so we learn lots of basic physics from looking at these objects. Um, and that's been true of neutron stars. But for black holes, that's even more true because the um, uh, bigger stars, um, when they collapse, they leave something behind in the center, which is too big to be a stable white dwarf or neutron star becomes a black hole. And we know that there are lots of black holes weighing about 10 or up to 50 times as much as the sun, which are the remnants of, of stars. They were detected first 50 years ago when a black hole was orbiting around another star and grabbing material from the other star, which swirled into it and gave us X-rays. So the X-rays astronomers found these um, uh, uh, objects orbiting around an ordinary star and emitting X-ray radiation very intensely, varying on a very short time scale. So something very small and dense was giving that radiation. That was the first evidence for black holes. Um, but then the other thing that happened was realizing that there was a different class of monster black holes in the centers of galaxies. And um, uh, these are responsible for what's called quasars, which is when uh, um, something in the center of a galaxy is grabbing some fuel and outshines all the 100 billion stars or so in the rest of the galaxy. It's a giant beam. Yeah, and, 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 light. and in many cases, it should be, it should be, it should be. Is, is that, 
Yeah. That's got to be the most epic thing the universe produces is quasars. Um, well, it's a, it's a debate about what's most epic, but uh, quasars maybe, or maybe gamma ray bursts or something, but, but they are remarkable, and they were a mystery for a long time. And they're one of the things I worked on in my uh, younger days. So um, even though they're so bright, they're still a mystery. And but, can well, you, I, I wouldn't you say, can only see them. I think they're less of a mystery now. I think we do understand basically what's going on. How, how were quasars discovered? Well, they, they were discovered when astronomers found things that looked like stars and that they were p- small enough to be a point-like, mm-hmm. and not resolved by a telescope, mm-hmm. but uh, uh, outshone an entire galaxy. Yeah, and uh, that's did, suspicious. Yeah, yes, but, <laughs> but, but, uh, um, but then they, they realized that what they were, well, they, they were um, uh, uh, objects which you now know are black holes, and they were... Um, uh, uh, black holes were capturing gas, and that gas was getting very hot, but it was producing um, far more energy than all the stars added together. And it was the energy of the uh, black hole that was um, lighting up all the gas in the galaxy. So you've got a spectrum of it uh, there. So, so th- th- this was something which was realized from the 1970s onwards. Um, and uh, as you say, the other thing we've learned is that they often do produce these jets squirting out, um, which could be detected in uh, in all wave bands. So, um, th- so there's now a standard picture. Yeah. Black hole generating jets of light yeah, yeah. at the center of most galaxies. Yes, that's right. Do we know, do we have a sense if every galaxy has one of these big, big boys, well, big uh, black most, holes? Most galaxies have big black holes. They vary in size. The one in our Galactic Center. Do we know much about ours? We we do. Yes, we um, we know um, uh, it weighs about as much as four million suns, uh, which is less than some, which are several billion in other galaxies. Um, and we, but we know this um, the one in our galactic center isn't very bright or conspicuous, and that's because not much is falling into it at the moment. Mm-hmm. If if a black hole is isolated, then of course it doesn't radiate. It only uh, all that radiates is gas swirling into it, which is very hot or has magnetic <laughs> fields. It's only radiating the thing it's murdering or consuming, right. or however you put it. Yeah, that, that, that's right. And so <laughs> so um, it's thought that our galaxy may have been bright, bright at some time in the past, ah. but now, uh, uh, and that, that's when the, the black hole formed or grew, um, but, but now it's uh, not um, capturing very much gas. And so it's it's rather... It's rather faint, and uh, you know, you're detected indirectly and by fairly weak radio emission. And uh, and so, uh, I think the answer to your question is that um, uh, we suspect that most galaxies have a black hole in them. So that means at some stage in their lives, or maybe one or more stages, they went through a phase of being like a quasar, where that black hole um, captured gas and became very very bright. But for the rest of their the lives, the black holes are fairly quiescent because there's not much gas falling into them. And so this universe of ours is sprinkled with a bunch of galaxies and giant black holes yes. with like very large number of stars uh, orbiting these black holes and then planets orbiting. Likely, it seems like planets orbiting almost every one of those stars that's or, right. <laughs> and just this beautiful universe of ours. Well, what happens when galaxies collide? When these two big black holes collide? Is that yes. is um, uh, well? Um, what would happen is that uh, well, and I should say that um, this is going to happen near us one day, but not for four billion years, because the Andromeda Galaxy, which is the biggest galaxy near to us, which is about nearly three million light years away which is a big disk galaxy with a black hole as its hub, rather like our Milky Way. And um, that's uh, um, in falling towards us because they're both in a common gravitational potential well. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, that will collide with our galaxy in about 4 billion years. But it'll be, it'll be maybe it'll be less a collision and more of a dance because it'll be like a swirling situation. Well, it's a swirling, but eventually there'll be, there'll be a merger. There, there'll go through each other and then merge. In fact, uh, um, there the are nice movies to be made of this, you know, computer simulations, yes. and it'll, it'll go through. Um, and um, uh, and then um, the, there's a black hole 
in the sense of Andromeda and our galaxy, and the galaxy, the black holes will uh, settle towards the center. Yes. Then they will orbit around each other very fast, and then they will eventually merge, and that'll produce a big burst of gravitational waves. Yes. Um, a very big burst. That um, an alien civilization with a LIGO-like detector will be able to detect. Y yes. Well, in fact, well, but we can detect these with them. Um, they're lower frequencies than the, uh, the ways that have been detected by LIGO. So there's a, a space interferometer which can detect these. They're, they're about it's about one cycle per hour, <laughs> rather than about a hundred cycles per second. Yes, it's the ones that detected. Um, but, but that that, that will happen. But um, uh, thinking back to what will happen in four billion years to uh, any of our descendants, they'll be okay because the, um, the the two disk galaxies will merge and it'll end up as a sort of amorphous elliptical galaxy. Mm -hmm. But um, the stars won't be much closer together than they are now. Uh, it'll, it'll still be just twice as many stars in a structure almost as big. And so um, uh, the chance of uh, another star colliding with our sun would still be very small. And, yeah, because there's actually a lot of space between indeed, stars yeah, and yeah, planets. Yes, and yes so the so chance on. of a star getting close enough to affect our solar system's orbit is small, and it, it won't change that very much. So uh, uh, that would you could be, be reassured. A, a heck of a starry sky, though. What would that look like? Well, it like? won't make much difference even to that, actually. It'll just be... Um, Wouldn't the, that the, look kind of beautiful when you're swirling? Or is oh, cause it's because swirling so slowly? Yeah, they're, but they're far away, so there'll be, be twice as many stars in the sky. Yeah, and but the pattern changes. The pattern, yeah, ways. the pa pattern will change a bit, and uh, there won't be the Milky Way because the Milky Way uh, uh, across the sky is because we are looking in the disk of our galaxy, and uh, you lose that, and because the um, the disk will be sort of disrupted, and uh, it'll be a more sort of spherical distribution. And of course, many galaxies are like that, um, and that's probably because they have been through mergers of this kind.